Welcome to Christian Answers. This is Pastor Jeff Short. Glad to have you along for our discussion today. Today we're going to be talking about a topic that I recently ran into that is related to our Christian faith in the, in the aspect of perhaps Bible prophecy, but also how we as Christians exist in our culture. And it's the article that I found in a recent Time magazine called The Cash-Free Society. And this is an article that I ran across just a couple of days ago. And it says that uh, China pulls ahead in the digital currency race. And then it goes through and it talks about how the world economies are going digital. They're going cashless. There's a goal to someday at some point become cash free. And when I hear these words, when I hear an article about a cashless society, a cash free society, I recall the days when I first became a Christian back in the day. And at that time, there was a big push in Bible prophecy and books being written about the one world government, the mark of the beast, the cashless society. Uh, You'll receive a mark on your forehead and your hand, and this will be the only way you'll be able to do economic transactions in society, and you'll have to get this chip in your hand or in your head. And this cash-free digital society uh, economic plan will take care of a lot of problems, but the warnings were all negative, saying we as Christians should not buy into that because that is a means of control by Antichrist, by this big, fantastically huge one world government. And this cashless society will be bad news for Christians, and we need to resist it and not uh, participate in it. And here we are with an article in Time Magazine saying cash-free society is on its way and China is leading the way. They're already using a basically like a an application on their smartphone where you just hold it up to the register and it will debit the amount that you're purchasing. So we've seen these before. Uh, I see them in, for example, coffee houses. I've been in a Starbucks to grab a cup of coffee, and I've seen people use their smartphones. They just hold it up to a scanner, and it scans and removes that amount from their account. So that's the way the economics are going right now in the world. It's not just in the Western world. It is in the entire world because China is in Asia, Asia, and in fact dominates the whole continent of Asia, So it's already here. It's already being used. It hasn't come to the United States as an overwhelmingly predominant way of purchasing things, but it is fast approaching that situation here. We haven't yet worked out all the details, and that will make Christians have to think through these issues. Christians and churches will have to grapple with these issues. And find out what is a biblical Christian response to a cashless society. And these are the kinds of things that will have to be discussed in churches. Unfortunately, most churches, I think it's safe to say, stay clear of these issues. And that's one of the other things I want to talk about today, is how churches have been playing it safe for far too long, and churches are going to have to stop playing it safe, and they're going to have to start discussing issues that are relevant to the body of Christ. And the reason, one of the reasons why our nation and our culture, the Western culture, is in such dire straits right now is that the churches have been playing it safe on Sunday morning. Pastors have been playing it safe from the pulpit They don't want to ruffle feathers. They don't want to offend people. They don't want to alienate people. They want everyone in those seats on Sunday morning. And so the easiest way to do that is to stay clear of any controversial issues, stay clear of any type of advocating of one position over the other in as far as cultural issues that are being debated in our culture at the time. And so what has happened is that Christians go to church on Sunday most of the time, And they never 
hear or never are faced with these issues from a Christian viewpoint. And so by default, they just simply turn to the mainstream media or they turn to their friends at work or they just read some magazines or listen to the news on the radio and they are being fed and discipled by secular forces in our society on all of these important issues. They are never addressed, hardly ever, from the church, from the pulpit, by pastors. Uh, they're, they're playing it safe. They're trying to sit on that fence and not fall off on either side of the cultural war. And what has happened is that Christians are not equipped. They don't know how to process reality as it's coming toward them. They're not being fed a Christian worldview, a consistent Christian worldview. They're basically being taught personal philosophies and success tips and psychological tricks to be happy and content in life and they are fed a very narrow scope of the Christian faith. When you open the pages of the Bible, there is a wide scope of truth that is presented in the Bible. It's not just this little narrow me and Jesus personal relationship. That's all that matters, me and Jesus. Um, It's big. It's wide. It talks about marriage. It talks about family. It talks about community. It talks about nations. It talks about the world. It, it, the Christian biblical view of reality encompasses everything. This is what Francis Schaeffer talked about in his book, True Spirituality, that I read many, many years ago, that is still being published today, that shows its relevance. Uh, true spirituality means Christ is Lord over every aspect of your life. He's Lord over the economic aspects of your life. He is Lord over the political aspects of your life. Who you vote for on, at a presidential election must be consistent with your Christian principles and worldview, or else it's disobedient to Christ. Everything is to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, every area, economic. And so churches, when they focus on a very narrow personal kind of success-oriented track preaching, they are neglecting so much. And it's really showing up in the churches because we have a very unhealthy state of Christianity here in the United States right now. Uh, We have thousands and thousands of churches. We have some of these are mega churches of tens of thousands of people that come on Sundays. And yet, For all this apparent visible Christianity, all these churches, all these megachurches, millions of people affiliated with churches, our influence is so small. Uh, Back in 2015, when the so-called gay marriage uh, was uh, decided by the Supreme Court, there were perhaps a majority of churches in this country and even uh, evangelical megachurches who did not even comment on that debate when it was taking place in our society. Now, thankfully, there were some faithful, godly, Bible-believing, courageous pastors who stood up in the pulpit and said, okay, now we're going to talk about, from a Christian biblical perspective, the biblical view of marriage and why this ungodly, abominable, thing called gay marriage is sinful, evil, and we need to appoint, uh, oppose it. Yes, there were faithful pastors who stood up courageously and taught the people the Word of God on this controversial subject, but the vast majority of pastors and churches and even denominations, they didn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Why? Because it alienates people. It divides people. It makes people angry. It offends people. People leave the church they walk off mad. It, it is a contentious issue. It's a controversial issue. So a lot of these pastors and churches and denominational leaders said, no, nope, we're not even going to touch that. We want all the people in all the seats on Sunday morning. And if we wade into that area, a lot of people are going to leave our church because they disagree with what is being said from the front. And so they were silent on this groundbreaking foundation-shaking, monumental, uh, sinful decision by the Supreme Court. And 
there are Christians today who actually uh, in favor of this decision because they cannot think biblically. They do not know. They are not trained how to think with a Christian worldview. And so our churches need to abandon this idea that they can stay above the cultural fray. Uh, No, they need to go down into the culture and take the Bible in one hand and the newspapers in the other hand and say, God, help us make sense of what we are seeing in our world today with your word and apply it accurately. And if that had been done in 2015, we probably wouldn't have gay marriage. But because pastors have been neglectful of teaching the full counsel of God out of fear of offending man, we have this and now many more other terrible issues heading our way. The big push right now is the LGBTQ movements, the transgender acronym of the LGBT acronym. Now, that's the big push. We're being forced to accept a person's declaration if they want to declare that they're a a person of the opposite sex. Well, we have to honor that. We have to use their pronouns. We have to use their their, uh, gendered name that they choose for themselves. We have to buy into that whole delusion. And a lot of churches still will not touch that subject. They will not talk about it. They will not discuss it. They will not present it. They will not look at the scripture and find out what God's word says about this. They will just leave that to the people, find out information about this elsewhere because the church will never say a word because it's too afraid somebody might leave. And they're so desperate for people in the pews that they would rather water down God's word or worse yet, worse than water it down, just not even talk about a topic because it is too divisive. No, that has to go away. That whole attitude has to go away. We need to have courageous pastors. We need to have courageous church leaders who stand up and say, we are going to hear God's word on this subject. Now, it's the same way with a cash-free society. Like I said before, when I became a Christian, it seems like a long time ago, This was in the news, Bible prophecy, rise of the Antichrist, the rise of the one world government, the rise of a cash-free society, the rise of the mark of the beast, and Christians will be asked and often forced, so-called, the so-called prophecies said that they would be forced to take the mark of the beast, but we must resist and say, no, we won't do it. And that was big back then. It fell out of interest for a number of decades, but now, again, I think we're going to see a rise of interest in trying to figure this out. Okay, as Christians, do we buy into the cashless society? And we need to begin to process this. And again, the churches are at a crossroad. Are they going to talk about how Christians are to live in a secular society that wants to steer them in the way of a totalitarian uh, one-world cash-free society, and how do we process that? Are they going to talk about that, or are they going to play the same playbook play that they played with, like gay marriage and all these other social issues? Are they going to stay clear of it? Oh, we don't want to touch that because that is controversial, and we want people in the seats on Sunday morning. We don't want anybody leaving our church. We want everybody here on Sunday morning. And if we talk about these things, some people will leave because they disagree. We need courage again on this issue. But one of the things that strikes me when I read an article like this about the cash-free society is from a Christian viewpoint and the biblical worldview We know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone is a sinner. Even those who are the best of us and also the rest of us, we're all sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is not one righteous, no, not one. That's what the book of Romans teaches. That's what our Christian worldview teaches, that all have sinned and 
fall short of the glory of God. There is no, no one righteous, no, not one. And so because of that, we should not trust any one person or any one group of people to take ultimate power. And so that was the principle of the founding of the United States. That is something of a Christian influence on the founding of our nation. The founding fathers uh, were not all personally Christians, but they had this Christian worldview or a semi-Christian worldview. They had been raised in the Christian West uh, that had been dominated by the Christian church for century after century after century. And one of the teachings of Christianity is that there is the fall of man and woman uh, in Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were given a command, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest you die. And they proceeded to disobey God's command and then were banished from the Garden of Eden. That is called the fall. And since that time, all of humanity, uh, every generation since then, has been under what is called original sin or inherited corruption. So even a little baby, it's born, it has a sin nature. When it grows up, it will begin to act out on that sinful nature because it is a child of Adam and Eve. And everyone on this planet cannot be trusted. Nobody can be trusted um, because they're all sinners in need of salvation. That's why the message of Jesus Christ is a universal message to all people. Repent and believe. And all who repent and all who believe will be saved from their sins and from the consequences of their sinful nature and their actual sins. But even among the saved, we cannot trust any one individual or any group of individuals with ultimate power because what is the old saying? I think it was a, a gentleman from England called Lord Acton. Uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So this was what the founding fathers had in mind. And they said, okay, we know human nature is sinful and corrupt. And they were taught that by the Judeo-Christian biblical teachings from Genesis and also carried over into the New Testament. Paul, the apostle, teaches the same thing in Romans. They knew that all of humanity was sinful, and so they said, let's come up with a government that compensates for the sinfulness, inherent sinfulness and selfishness of man, the inherent untrustworthiness of man. So no one individual, no one can become all-powerful and no group can become all-powerful and unchecked. So what we want to do is create a number of checks and balances. And so that's exactly what our government here in the United States has. It has all kinds of checks and balances so that the sinful nature of any one individual or the sinful nature of any one group cannot be allowed to have absolute power, because that would be tyrannical, tyrannical, and that would be totalitarian tyrannical. And so that one little teaching of the Judeo-Christian uh, orthodoxy, which is the sinfulness of humanity, was the basis for the checks and balances we have in our government right now. So we, have, we break up the power in three branches, and then the different branches can hold... Uh, other branches accountable. And then we have checks and balances as far as uh, officers in the government can be removed. They can be impeached. They can be censored. Um, there can be, uh, th there has to be two-thirds majority. Uh, all kinds of checks and balances. If you go through the Constitution and you go through the, the framing, founder, uh, framing documents of our, of our nation, you will see that this whole idea of safeguarding against inherent sinfulness and selfishness of, of individuals is there. And it's a great innovative breakthrough in the world of governments. And it comes from the Bible and it prevents a lot of bad things happening. Now, we do have a 
philosophy now in politics, uh, socialism, that doesn't have that check and balance and doesn't even concern itself with checks and balances. It wants power. It wants totalitarian power. That's what we're seeing today. That's what we actually see in California right now. We see a effort by liberal leftists to actually lock up that state so you don't have the checks and balances that you should have and you can have absolute power. One party can be an absolute power in the state of California and they want that vision for the whole country and they will get it unless some miracle happens because we're seeing the, the institutions of our society right now line up in lockstep with that socialist vision. We're seeing the uh, mainstream media, we're seeing academic universities and colleges, we're seeing big businesses, we're seeing all kinds of institutions lockstep in line with this vision. So we're going to have uh, a totalitarian, one unified power, which is dangerous from a Christian viewpoint. Now, when you come back to the cash-free society, the cashless society that Time Magazine is talking about here, you're going to think in the similar way as you would politically. You're going to say, well, wait a minute. If there's a cashless society and the central bank of the United States, for example, is issuing this digital currency that everybody can use, well, you can see the, the dangers because if you have a group of people, whether it's a committee uh, of the central bank, uh, Federal Reserve, uh, the, you, would, you would have one group of people who would be in total control of all of the money supply. So you can't have that when you have separate cash with bills, you pay physical currency. You can always store away some physical currency for yourself. They can't confiscate that. But if you have a digital currency that's held in a central computer somewhere with servers, hidden secret server locations, uh, there's always someone who's going to be able to hack into that. And there, and even the committee itself could determine and vote that the currency needs to be debased or the currency needs to be limited or there needs to be a currency change. You know, in some nations in past history, uh, central governments have said, well, we're just going to do away with the present currency and change to another form of currency. And so everyone who has saved up those actual physical material currency is out of look, luck because there's no more value to these. It's just worthless paper. So that's how they have been able to control uh, the currency and economic situation of a nation in the past. Well, now you can see it's even more dangerous because if you have a digital currency where nobody actually ever keeps cash and nobody actually ever uh, has physical money on their possession, but the only thing they have is like a smartphone and a barcode and they just flash that barcode in front of the scanner and it scans and it debits that amount that you purchased now, the danger of that is that they can wipe your account out at any moment. The government can. It can hold that over you because it holds all your money. And it's illegal to hold any other kind of currency. So you can see that this is really tempting for people who want to be in power and want to hold on to power and there is all kinds of mischief that can come from this cash-free society. So as Christians, we have to grapple with these issues. And churches need to talk about them from a Christian standpoint. We can't just say, well, you know, we can't talk about that. Just like we can't talk about that. And we can't talk about that and that and that and that. Because people disagree. And people are on both sides of the aisle on this. And there isn't agreement and it's controversial, and people might leave the church, people might be offended, they might be mad. No, we have to put all of that aside and say, look, as Christians, we have to do what the early church did, and that is they got together and they talked about things. I can imagine in the first century when, for example, in Jerusalem, the Jewish community 
started blackballing, you might say, or ostracizing or marginalizing the Jewish Christians, the church would have to get together and say, okay, how do we together survive? How are we going to feed our families? How are we going to pay our bills when we're cut out of the Jewish economy? If you're Jewish and you're in the sea, in a sea of the Roman Empire and you have this little Jewish enclave in the Middle East called the Holy Land, and you become a Christian, and now the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, don't like Christians, and so they cut you out of the economic life of the Jewish community, you have to grapple with these issues. And they did. They talked about them, and they came up with solutions, and that's what the Church of Jesus Christ today has to do. They have to put away this little narrow church topic limitation that we have, to basically psychological states and success principles and just talking about those things. Yeah, they're interesting. Yeah, the Bible talks about some of these things, but it's not something that should be dominant in our churches. We should talk about the things that are important to people at the moment. And this cash-free society may become a reality. And as Christians, we need to work through what our response should be to this, unlike how the Christian community dealt with some of these other social issues where they basically ignored it, we have to put away this emphasis on growing big in churches. We have to put away this emphasis on having the huge building with thousands of people jam-packed in there. Yeah, that looks nice on Sunday morning. That strokes the egos of the pastors and the leaders of the church. Wow, look what we've done. It's very prestigious, and it sure looks great in the pictures, but that's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about individual Christians living out their Christian life and spreading the gospel and taking their biblical revelation that God has given them out into the world and applying it to every area of life. And so we need to know how to deal with the threats that are going to come our way how do we deal if, say, for example, the United States uh, decides that it wants to become a cash-free society and use only digital currency? What are the threats to religious liberties under that scheme? What are the threats to individual Christians when uh, this concentration of power becomes apparent where you have the source of economy in the hands of one central committee, and they can wipe out your bank account in a split second, how do Christians respond to that threat? And we need to talk about these things because they are real and they are coming our way. And this Time Magazine article is only just giving us a little foretaste of what's to come. I really do believe that there will be a one world currency one day, and we need to think about the implications of that as Christians. Well, I hope that's been a helpful commentary. We'll see you back next week on another edition of Christian Answers. God bless.